Good morning. Awesome to have you join us in our live stream of our 1030 worship service. This is our contemporary worship here at Summit of Peace. I'm Pastor Jeremy Jacoby, Senior Pastor. I'll be sharing a message today in the sermon series we're doing uh, called You Asked For, and today we're looking at how do we honor our government even if we disagree with what we're doing, uh, with what they're doing. Uh, Pastor PJ Stolman is going to be leading us uh, during our times of worship, and we have a change today. No longer Big Daddy Ty. Do you have a stage name? Big Daddy, I can't steal that. that doesn't sound as good. But we have David and Katie Runkle. Uh, at first service, they serenaded each other. So we'll, we'll see if when they lead today, they look long and lean in each other's eyes or what the deal is. But thanks for helping out today. We appreciate it. Uh, it's great for you to have us join in on the stream. Probably, hopefully, uh, there's a couple of gentlemen out on a lake in Nebraska who are watching the service as well. They're out on a fishing trip that usually I'm invited to every year, except this one for some reason. So I'm hoping that their trip... It's sort of like when the disciples fish without Jesus. They always have empty nets. Remember that? So uh, otherwise, uh, great to have you joining us today. Just to remind you of a couple things. Uh, Facebook um, will have our children's message at 9.15. It's already up at 9.15, so you can check that for our children's message, which is pulled out. Uh, drive through communion, we already did, but we'll do it again on Tuesday. And as always, you can submit your prayers in the comment section of our feed. You can do it at any time, uh, but the earlier the better. It helps us all the way through the time of our offering. Uh, I think that's it in terms of our announcement. Why don't we prepare our hearts with our first song? In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. He's cornerstone, he's solid ground. Begin our worship as always, remembering the name in which we were baptized into, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me in a prayer of confession. Lord Jesus Christ, we come before you and we acknowledge that we are by nature sinful and unclean. That too often we do things that you tell us not to do, and too often we neglect to do the things you tell us to do. We confess our sin and our thoughts and our words and our actions. And especially today, Lord, we remember these times when we have failed to put you first in our lives and to seek your will above everything else, especially in matters of government, 
and the authorities that you have established over us on this earth. Pray, Lord, that you would teach us to honor these authorities, to teach us what it means to live as your people under government. We pray, Lord, that you would give us your Holy Spirit to strengthen us and renew us and to lead us in the life everlasting. In Jesus' name, amen. It is in Christ alone that we stand, and it's in him that we have forgiveness and life and salvation. And it's that forgiveness that I declare to you today of all of your sins. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Today, our first reading comes from the Old Testament, 1 Samuel, chapter 8. The people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, No, but there shall be a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go up before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey their voice and make them a king. Samuel then said to the men of Israel, Go every man to his city. The word of the Lord. Our 
Our second reading comes from Romans chapter 13. Paul writes, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Word of the Lord. Our gospel reading today comes from Matthew chapter 22. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle Jesus in his words. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why do you put me to test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they bought him, brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. This is the gospel of the Lord. I invite you to confess our faith in the one true God with me in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being in one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you, open the eyes of my heart,
Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. We'll be looking at all of our uh, texts from today, but in particular I would like us to focus on these words of Jesus. Then he said to him, Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar, and to God the things that are God's. So we are in our sermon series entitled, You Asked For It, and today we've uh, tackled actually a pretty big question. How do I honor my government when I disagree with what they are doing? Uh, And kind of with with all of these questions, we have um, kind of looked at the question that's behind the question, right? We've wrestled a little bit to see, like, wondering what people were meaning. And so there's been a little bit of that with this one. But I also recognized, and I'll talk a little bit uh, about this throughout, that this is probably too big a topic to cover, like, at one time, right? This could have been its own uh, sermon series. In fact, I was thinking this is probably, I could easily talk for, like, 60 minutes on this alone. So we're going to go long today. No, I'm just kidding. We're not, we're not going to do that. No. In fact, I think probably in the fall we'll, we'll do another sermon series that's just about sort of Christianity, politics in America, something like that. But in the meantime, I still want to honor and kind of tackle this question of, of how do I honor my government when I disagree with what they're doing. So as I was wrestling with that question and wondering what some people might think behind it, I, in my mind at least, didn't think that people were really asking about um, when, in Christi- when, when our governments are actually persecuting uh, Christianity, like when they're forcing things that are against the Word of God. Uh, I'm taking this question to mean much more around the, the just kind of the struggles we have when we have firm political beliefs and um, and we're passionate about them and and we feel like they're contrary to what what God says we should do or as a nation or as a people. Um, and so, in fact, in some ways, if you want to think of it, it's sort of like around this question. Uh, what do I do when I disagree with my government's, you know, their platforms, their policies, or their legislation? We probably could even add to that. We could have said even uh, the behavior of, of certain leaders, uh, maybe the actions of the executive branch, any of the things like this. But, but in concept, just kind of the idea is what do we do when we're at odds with uh, where it is our government is going? And, of course, this is a super relative uh, question because in America, this is, like, what it's about, right? I mean, this is where... Uh, battles are won or lost, right? Every election season, there's winners and losers, and and some portion of our country is ecstatic, and the other, it's the end of the world. Um, and so I think if we wrestle and tackle this as, as Christians, we'll discover something um, more profound, and I think more helpful going forward. Because it's not simply uh, about do we... Um, do we believe that, that God is accomplishing what it is that he wants to only if our um, preferred political party is in charge. And so I'm going to kind of like ruin a lot of people's day, right? So just kind of hold on to your seats for a moment. Um, I want to talk to you about the party way. And by the party way, I don't mean uh, me in college. I mean um, instead the worldview or the answer to this question that views things from either this party uh, or that one. And so I'm going to kind of ruin your day by starting to tell you that God is not a Republican. I know you might be shocked, uh, nor Jesus, Uh, but neither are they uh, a Democrat. Not an independent, not Whigs, not Green parties, none of those. My personal opinion as a registered libertarian is that we have the best shot, but even if I'm honest there, God, not a libertarian, Jesus doesn't care about that party either. And, and I think that that is helpful for us to remember and to recognize as we start to tackle this question right from this point of view, right? Which is we largely answer this question and think about it from the context of my, there's my view, which is the right view, obviously, and my party's view, uh, and the other one. But to do so, I believe, actually misunderstands the place of government. And what I mean by that is this. We shouldn't forget that the the way we have government in this world now, the reason that we have it is because of the fall. Originally, Adam and Eve in the garden, there's no government, right? There's nobody elected to be in charge. There's this perfect relationship between them and God, one that is is destroyed by sin. But that actually doesn't keep God from continuing to try to lead us directly, to to be in relationship, to guide. In fact, it leads us to that, um, the the reading that we had that PJ read from, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8. I don't know if um, you know the context of it, but this is the way that it ended. It said, but the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, no, but there shall be a king over us that we can be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. So here's the context. 
To this point, Israel has had no king. This is after the time Moses has brought them into the uh, land of Israel, but their leaders are what they have been largely called judges. And God has only raised them up to tackle like specific things, right? Um, perhaps war with the Philistines or deal with specific issues. And these judges have continued to, to guide God's people only, as I mentioned, in need of these situations. But they haven't, they haven't ruled them, right? They're not their, their leader. And um, the problem at this point is that Samuel has two sons that are acting as judges, but they're not very good. Uh, in fact, they're so bad, they're actually taking bribes, and they're, they're not taking their job as God would want them. So the background of the story, I want you to listen to this. It starts this way. Um, <clears throat> so just so you know, um, this is never a good way to start a conversation with someone, but nonetheless, this is what the people say to Samuel. Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations." But this thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, listen to this, obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. See, what's interesting about here is that that the people of Israel see the nations around them and how they're governed and guided and directed this way, and they want it more directly as well, right? They want the, um, the actions of, of a single leader to, to sort of rein everything in and to get it into control, right? And, and I'm fascinated by this because, because look what they say, that a king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Now, here, for the Israelites, they mean that literally. Like, they want like a warrior king that they can rally behind every time, time they go to war. But I think that we still do the same thing. That we approach these, these things that we see in our country, issues that we might have, right? Things of which we're afraid, right? If, if su- such and such is elected or if this policy is passed, right? It's the end of the world and we're so terrified and we want someone to fight our battles. And so we choose as our mechanism to tackle these things, our political party and our political views. The problem is that, is that it doesn't really work. Or it only works as long as you're the political party that's in charge, right? I was kind of thinking about it in this context. I was remembering uh, we all like it, right, when there's someone to, to keep the rules and, right, keep everybody in line as long as we're not someone who breaks those rules, right? Um, I kind of remember this. I don't know if you grew up in school. Uh, I was one of those kids who never got in trouble with anything. Um, Julie's laughing out loud, but what I mean is I never got caught doing anything. But just to give you an example of what I mean. So one of my favorite teachers at Denver Lutheran High was a um, teacher by the name of Mr. Kirch, Glenn Kirch. Taught us uh, English mostly, a couple other classes. And uh, I had a really great relationship. I would try to take all of his classes that uh, I could. And then one time, he was also our athletic director. I think he got called out for something like that. And I got every single person in the classroom to pick up their desks and turn around and face the other way so that when Mr. Kirch came back in the room, he was like, you know, we're all facing the wrong way. But of course, there was the one person who wouldn't do it, right? And to me, this is how I think oftentimes we, we behave. We, we want someone to enforce what we believe should be done politically, right? And make everyone else kind of fall in line. But the challenge that I think, and the thing that we often aren't honest about is, we want them to enforce the things that we don't have an issue or struggle with right? From the Republican side, I think a lot of us think, you know, hey, uh, Jesus would totally be with us because of the moral, um, uh, the moral backing of, of what the Republicans say, we are, like what's good morally, right? And we want, we want people to go out and make and enforce those morals. And the good news is we don't struggle with the things we want to be enforced. Or, or maybe from the Democratic side, right? We feel like, hey, Jesus would be on our side when it comes to things about caring for, for those, right? For, for, for the dignity of all, for, for justice and things like that, right? And we would think Jesus w- would be for us, right? And he would do those things, but we want someone to make us take care of people. Or we want someone to make other people take care of people. Right? So the truth of the matter is I, I could stand here today and I could deliver you a message, believe it or not, from the Bible that says why the Republican Party uh, upholds Christian teachings. But likewise, I could stand here and tell you why the Democratic Party upholds Christian teachings. But either way that I did that, I'd be doing the wrong thing. I'd be approaching it from the wrong direction. I'd be looking for a political solution 
to a much greater problem. And that's what makes me think of the Jesus way. Jesus was actually in the, the same situation, right? He was being forced to choose between two points of view. I don't know about you, but uh, the longer I've been kind of old enough to vote and evolved, especially in national elections, the more I feel like every single year I'm trying to choose the lesser of two evils. And, and I've even gotten to where I, like, that's how I say that. And maybe many of you feel that way as well. But here's the problem. We've actually gotten so far down that road that when we pick the lesser of two evils, we actually forget that ours is still evil, is still broken, is still faulty. We, we actually talk like our political party or our leaders are actually perfect just because they're not as bad as what we think is the other side. And I don't know if you realize this, but Jesus had the exact same opportunity, was placed in the exact same situation. He handled it differently. It's these words that I read. They were part of the gospel lesson. Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? Talking about the coin, they said Caesar. And he said to them, therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled. And they marveled because Jesus um, didn't pick a side. This is hard to kind of picture just from this short lesson. We get this from the other gospels and stuff. But what's taking place is actually Jesus is in the, the shadow literally of the temple. And he's being confronted by basically the nation of Israel, the religious leaders, the people who are like, this is what, what God would be about, right? And he's also being confronted by what are called the Herodians. These are those who would support the, 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 the government, right? The, the, the ruling of Rome uh, over the Israelites. And I don't know about you or the nation of Israel. I don't know about you, but you expect Jesus to say, well, yeah, I, I'm on the side of Israel, right? I mean, Israel should have its own voice. It should have its own king. It should be self-directed. It should be pursuing these things, right? Or maybe to even say, hey, this is the government that is in charge. You know, Israel forsaken, had forsaken its calling, forgotten the covenant, and so this is the place. But he actually refuses to take either sides because he has come to replace both of them, to do away with both of them, and to be placed in a situation in which you're saying you have to choose between the lesser of two evils. He says it's neither. That what he's about is what God is about, about the mission that God has sent him upon. And, and what he's really doing is he's directing us and reminding us that we have to filter our views, our political views, through the teaching of God's word and not the other way around. Right? We have to start with what does God's word say, and then we're, we're able to be honest and recognize there are places in, in our favorite politician or party's platform or policies that are consistent with God's word, but there are also some that aren't. And so I'm guessing by now, just about every single one of you are sitting at home and you're thinking, you know what? Pastor Jacoby, he is dead right. I know the exact person who needs to hear this because they do not let God's word filter their politics, but they do it the other way. And if you're sitting there and if you're thinking that, we have to start over again. Because I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about you. And I'm really talking about myself because I, I honestly believe this. It is that difficult because we, we come from a place where we're raised oftentimes deeply influenced about our political beliefs from how we grew up and what we've experienced. And it's so difficult to, to step out of them and see them through the filter of God's word. But this is what, what Jesus upholds for us, right? This is the Jesus way is to say, I'm not about either thing. Hey, Jesus, are you on the side of this government or the nation of Israel? And his answer is, I'm on God's side. And in that way, he's on the side of everyone. And what he's trying to do, what he's trying to accomplish, it, it, it's so much more. It, it pales, in fact, in comparison to the questions he's being asked of, of, of what people are arguing about. But I still think that means that we can, we can legitimately struggle, right, with what our government is doing. That doesn't mean we, we just give in, right? And so I'd suggest to you, and hopefully you haven't misunderstood what I've said so far, like you should be involved in politics. If you're, if you're passionate about it, you're called to, to specific issues and things like that, you should be fully bought in, right? You should, I, everyone is encouraged to vote, to participate to the degree they believe they should and, and the way that their conscience and God's word guides them. But if you think that any single platform captures this perfectly, you have misunderstood the teaching of God's word. Because it cannot encapsulate what Jesus has come to do and is doing in our world. In fact, 
I think the best evidence is, is the early church way, right? I want you to think about um, Paul, right, is uh, writing to the Romans, uh, to church in Rome, um, and this is at a time when the persecution of Christians is kind of beginning, when there's been issues, and, and Paul, of course, has suffered all kinds of things throughout his, his ministry, right? And yet, even in the midst of that, he's able to write this, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. So again, looking at this, and again, going back to our original question, I'm still not answering things like if, if we're talking about uh, overt persecution of Christians or, or governments tr- trying to um, prescribe behavior that actually violates God's word, right? We're still talking about where we have the, the freedom to choose and to, to react against what our government is doing and what what Paul reminds us of here is that you, the authorities that you have are the ones that God wanted you to. And, and I know this is, uh, this is popular every four years um, by the party who wins. They love to remind everyone, you know what? This is the president that God wanted us to have, and you all just have to accept it. The crazy thing is, though, four years later, they seem to have forgotten it when it's not their person anymore, right? As if God wasn't paying attention. And he's like, oh, man, I forgot about that election in America. What am I going to do now? That's not how it works. God is using a human institution to accomplish his will, but it is not supposed to replace him and what he has done. Paul talks about it really as government, as a, an operation of the law, right? To punish the wrongdoer, to reward uh, the good. And certainly there's times when governments actually mix those up, when governments punish the good and, and uphold the wrongdoer. But I think if you look at the early church, it goes even beyond this. I want you to stop and think about something for a second. I want you to imagine we're right about 85 AD. Um, and there's this, this weird Nazarene sect is what they called it originally in the book of Acts, right? There's this weird belief system that started in the nation of Israel. And it was about a rabbi who ended up put to death. And he had 12 followers. Uh, one killed himself. That guy got replaced, and now by 85 AD, all of them have been executed, except for one. His name's John, and he's actually in exile on an island. So it's 85 AD, and it looks like the church is all but dead, right? Its leaders are executed. In fact, the guy who started it is dead. And now, 300 years later, the nation of Rome declares itself to be Christian. How did that happen? If we, we dive into the Bible or, or look at history, do we discover that finally the Christians got their act together, they began a political movement, they were able to get their Caesar in charge, their guy elected, right? They started, in the, um, they started a campaign, they raised a bunch of money, they scared people. That's the best way to raise money. I don't know if you know that. This is what's going to happen if you don't. They didn't do any of that. What the Christians did is they believed the words of Jesus that called them to a way of life that was different. And in fact, it was so different to the Roman world. It was so contrary to the values of the Roman Empire that at first they laughed at them, but then they began to persecute them because it so terrified the established world. And what were those behaviors? They began to treat slaves and women with equal dignity to say that they're just as much sons and daughters of the true king as any nobleman, as any male. And they did much more than that. Just to give you one example, there was the practice in the Roman world that was um, to expose uh, newborns to the elements, right? They would, um, they would take, for example, if a, if a family had too many girls and they didn't want them anymore, they would actually take, midwives would take this baby girl out and just leave her at the city gate, the wall out in the wilderness. And in the Roman mind, what they were doing is they were leaving it to the fates. If the baby girl was supposed to survive, then she would. And they would do that, for example, uh, a man could do that if he believed that a son born to him wasn't actually uh, from him if his wife had been unfaithful, right? This is how uh, Roman society treated human life. And, and Christians came along, and they looked at the calling of Jesus. They looked at what Jesus did, and they looked at what Jesus said. And there's no Bible verse that says, don't do that, right? But it was clear to them that this is not in keeping 
with a God who loves each and every one of us individually, that loves each human life so much that he would die to rescue and to redeem it. And even before the time of Constantine, the Roman Empire eventually declared that to be illegal, the practice of exposing your children in this way. The Christians made the Roman Empire Christian, not through a political process, but by living according to God's word. And that hope, that bizarre behavior that that challenged a view that was so contrary to their own, eventually won it over. It spread almost like a virus until the entire nation was considered a Christian nation. So, my answer to your question today is this. If you disagree with what the government is doing, you still honor and respect that they are the ones who've been placed in authority over us and, and, and go fight your political battles. Go uh, raise money for the candidate you believe in, fight for those things that you, um, causes that you believe in, the parties that you believe in, pursue those diligently. But remember that that is a secondary way to accomplish. It is not the primary. The primary way that we'll accomplish God's will is by being his people. And we cannot be his people if we actually let our politics divide us from one another. If brothers and sister Christians are are actually choosing a political party over the bond that they have as God's beloved children. And the way that we will win back our nation is not through a political process or party, but is by being like the early church, loving our neighbors and the communities around us and showing them that there is a different way, that there is a God who loves us and everyone so much that he sends his own son into this world to die for them. And that that love and that hope that we have is for everyone. Amen. So today I want to share with you a little bit different behind the scenes, uh, our generosity moment. This is our behind the scenes one. We just want to kind of share with you a little bit uh, about all that it's taken to get our um, live stream going and, and all of the ways that we've um, kind of give, delivered content to you during this time. This includes all the rehearsals, the worship planning, setting up equipment, setting up the, the chancel and altar area, the um, maintenance of the church, the Zoom meetings that we have to plan stuff. And when I say Zoom meetings, I mean like lots and lots of Zoom meetings. Um, all the prepping, running the drive through communion, all the weekly email updates, social media planning, execution, delivering gifts to members, and all of our um, creating and recording videos, Facebook, Instagram, just a, kind of a picture of um, what it takes to, uh, to do that. And we recognize some of these are staff, but actually a lot of these people are, are volunteers who give of their time. And so we give thanks to God's generosity uh, delivered to, to us so that we can share it with you. And with that, um, we continue with our time of offering.
Please join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are our true king and that all your ways are good, all your ways are perfect, and that you direct us not in the ways that we want, which are often wrong and selfish, Lord, but you give us what we need and guide us even through the most difficult times to the way of abundant life that you prepared for us and to the wonderful, restored, perfect life that you will give to us that one day when we see you face to face. Lord, we pray that our hope and our trust would not be in our government or leaders or authorities, but ultimately it would be in you as our Lord and our Savior. Let everything we do, even in our relations with our government, would honor you and glorify your name, that we would seek your will above all things. Lord Jesus, we pray this for our church family. We pray for especially the Santa Stephen family, the Shalin family, the Sheev family, the Schleicher family, Cordero de Dios Lutheran, and um, in Denver, locally, uh, and pray for Lutheran Family Services and all the ministries out there, Lord, that seek to meet people's needs so that your name can be glorified. We especially remember today, Lord, uh, from Bob, his daughter-in-law is having an MRI. We pray for safety. We pray for uh, Bob's great-granddaughter, who was also born this morning. We thank you for the that new gift of life. From Shirley, we pray for Alden and the children of Audrey. From Holyoke, Colorado, on the passing of Christine, who lost her battle to cancer, we pray for comfort and peace to the family and friends. From Bev, we pray for all the unbelievers and those who do not yet know you, Lord, and the wonderful life and security that we have in you. From Jody, we pray for the recovery and pain relief uh, for everybody that's dealing with the virus and any other kinds of sickness. From Ian, we pray for all those who recently got their license or permit, that you would keep them safe and watch over them. And we also pray for the high schoolers as they finish up school this week, um, that you would give them the strength to finish finals and give them uh, good plans for the summer. From Laura, we pray for safe travel for Al and Mike. And from Lexi, we pray for healing and recovery for Rose. From Brittany, we pray for blessings for her niece Abby's ninth birthday and sister Brooke's birthday. And also her mom Barbara's birthday this Friday. We give you thanks and praise for them. From Kent, we pray for Liz, Liz's friend Melissa, who's has very widespread cancer. And we pray for the medical staff working with Melissa. We were about to start treatment on her. We pray for healing. For Marlies, we pray for her aunt and cousins, uh, the past of her uncle Larry. And anything else, Lord, we bring before you now, either spoken aloud or on the silence of our hearts. Lord Jesus, as your sons and daughters of your kingdom, pray that you would remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come, thy, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, as, as we forgive those who trespass, trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine in you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen.
Awesome. Thanks so much for joining us today. We pray that it was a joy and a blessing to you.